I'm Curtis Lassam. You can also find me on Twitter, I'm C. Lassam. I work at a company called Sauce Labs. They let me come to this conference and speak without burning any of my holiday PTO. So really take a moment to soak in this slide. I also make a programming comic called CubeDrone.com. And before I start my presentation, I'd like to say JavaScript very confidently a couple of times in case we get a DJ again next year. <laughs> JavaScript. 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 OK. So this presentation is called Horse Drawing Tycoon, the world's best horse drawing simulator, or how I turned the world's dumbest JavaScript application into some paid time off from work, or the unexpected virtue of ignorance. Yes, my presentation's full title is 31 words long. That's how you know you're going to get a lot of bang for your presentation buck. What other presenter is going to offer this sheer title density? Nobody. That's who. So I'm going to start this off with a story. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. VanJS is a small meetup local to Vancouver. After the meetup, I'm talking with a friend at a pub. He wants to make video games. So he has a bunch of ideas for video games. All of his ideas are really good, though. I took it upon myself to suggest some video game ideas that would never, ever work, like Breakout, but you play as the bricks. Because we were surrounded by software developers, somebody quickly volunteered the services of an indie game ge generator, which produced incredible ideas, like a horror game where you ride horses with ninjas inside a gigantic terrarium, or an FPS where you stab researchers and you have the power to become famous at will. These, idea the sorry, these ideas, too, were obviously much too good. I would play any of the games that it described. But eventually, it came to an idea so bad that nobody could ever want to play that game a tycoon game where you draw horses indefinitely. That's the worst idea for a game I'd ever heard. I had to build it. And of course, in order to finish it, before everybody forgot our bar conversation, I had to build it very quickly. Also, it didn't have to be very good. That affected a lot of design decisions. My VanJS companions had many questions. Questions like, how are you going to build it? Canvas? How do you know people are going to draw horses? Isn't this just going to end up being an obscenity drawing game? <laughs> I would discover the answers to these questions. Although, spoiler alert, I did not at any point build a horse recognizing artificial intelligence. So before I go any further into this presentation, I have to tell you that this is an actual piece of software that exists. I'm even going to do a short demo for you. Here we are, horse drawing tycoon. I can stamp horses on here. I can pick a color, I can pick a brush size, I can scribble. It's got everything. Okie doke. This is a horse that somebody drew with Horse Drawing Tycoon. This application has been running uninterrupted since I launched it. It's pretty stable. Uh. <laughs> and that brings us to chapter two, Canvas. The most interesting part of a horse drawing simulator would be, of course, the drawing part, which gives me an opportunity to talk about the HTML5 canvas element. The canvas tag allows you to create an element in the DOM that you can draw horses on. While I'm certain there may be other uses for the canvas element, say video games or stuff involving graphics, I can't see how any non-horse drawing use of canvas is worth thinking about or even acknowledging. A canvas element exposes something called a rendering context to the page's JavaScript. A rendering context is an object that encapsulates all of the actions that you can perform on the canvas, the entire canvas API. You can get a rendering context with code that looks like this. Then you can do stuff to the canvas element using the API defined by the rendering context. Here, for example, we're drawing a rectangle that is blue. Note that we're specifying a 2D context here. Canvas also has a 3D rendering API, although using it for our horse drawing application might be a bit out of scope. The primary primitives to draw with in Canvas are paths, rectangles, text, and bitmaps. The API calls focus heavily on drawing, coloring, erasing, rotating, scaling, transforming, animating, and compositing rectangles, paths, and text on a draw layer. This is the sort of tooling that lends itself really well to building a game engine, but for a stupid horse drawing application, it's actually a little bit complicated. The CreateJS libraries are a great collection of libraries for building rich content in JavaScript applications. 
There's preload.js, sound.js, tween.js, and easel.js. And easel.js is the part that we're interested in because it allows us to work easily with the HTML5 canvas. Easel.js contains convenience methods for working with a bunch of things that are useful for games, like sprites and buttons and blurs, points and strokes. The bitmap object, for example, is really useful for stamps. I don't have much to say about stamps, actually, except that if you dynamically set the CSS cursor property and use a bitmap object in Canvas, poof, we, we have horse stamps. This is a low-res demo of horse stamps in action. Now, stamps are all well and good, but this isn't horse stamping tycoon. This is horse drawing tycoon. And we can use the stroke object to draw horses. When figuring out how to draw horses, the first thing I tried was just to draw a circle under the pen every time I detected a mouse move while the user was also clicking. The perhaps obvious problem with that is that the mouse can move much faster than the sample rate of the browser. So instead of getting smooth flowing lines, we just get dots everywhere. That's no good. So the first thing I tried didn't work. We can connect those dots with lines to complete the drawing. This works pretty well, but fast movements will still result in jagged drawings filled with hard edges. I remember that DeviantArt Miro simulated curves by simply connecting lines to many previous points instead of just the last line. It was a beautiful effect, but it wasn't really what I was going for. No, instead, the technique that I ended up using was one that I found in a demo for CreateJS. Between every two points, I create a midpoint. And when I reach the next point in my drawing, I create a quadratic curve from the last midpoint to the next point. It's kind of complicated in this drawing. Quadratic Bezier curves are way simpler than they sound. They're just three-point curves. They go from one point to another, curving through a middle point. So here, we're just curving between the midpoint of the last line to the next point in our drawing. It ends up creating a nice, smooth curve. And here are some more horses that actual people have drawn using Horse Drawing Tycoon. OK, so we're done with Canvas for now. That takes us to chapter three, Lucid.js. At the Van.js presentation, I just attended a talk on Twitter's Flight, a componentiating event-driven framework. Flight looked interesting, and the concept of building my application as a collection of components that send and receive events really appealed to me. But for whatever reason, Flight itself wasn't the right framework for me. Uh, the reason was that months earlier, I had attended a talk on Lucid.js, which is pretty much the same thing, but I was paying way more attention during the Lucid.js presentation. So JavaScript also has its own baked-in event system, but I feel like it's important to maintain a separation between UI element elements like click and application elements like clear canvas. Let's look at a simple Lucid.js event emitter. We can create an emitter to manage events. Then we can bind a function to an event. Here we're binding a function to the super awesome event. Then we can call the function by emitting the super awesome event, passing any arguments we want to pass to the function. Lucid.js has a lot of features that are above and beyond a standard event emitter. You can have multiple emitters that selectively pipe specific events to one another. You can namespace events so that only specific listeners will receive those events. And you can even create meta listeners and listen on the very act of binding itself. Horse Drawing Tycoon comfortably ignores all of these features, but they're all potentially useful for larger applications. So how is this better than just defining global functions and then calling them? Well, more than one function can be bound against an event. For example, the component that manages the canvas element could bind a function to the change color event, a function that changes the color of the current brushstroke. At the same time, the component that manages the cursor could also bind to that event and change the color of the cursor when it receives the change color event. Both of these components are responding separately to the change color event, and neither of these components needs to know about the other or what the other component is doing with the event. The other benefit of an event stream is that these events become a stream of objects that you can manage. It's possible to serialize all events and store them for later, keeping a complete history of every action taken in your application. Or you could have a component that just listens for events that change the application's state and uses that to keep, of the keep track of the application's state using local storage. That same component could re-emit those events when the application boots up. Now, if that sounds like a needlessly convoluted way to handle serialization and local storage in your application, I can assure you that it is, because that's how Horse Drawing Tycoon stores data. And it's a bad idea. 
One of the problems with this sort of implementation is that components can tie whatever they want to an event. Replaying those events, we might only want to trigger some of those effects, but there's no really granular way to control them. This is one of those places where some of the more advanced features in Lucid.js would have come in handy, like namespacing, for example. If I were to rewrite the serialization of Horse Drawing Tycoon, I probably wouldn't do it that way. It's quite a bit more complicated than I needed to make it. I still think that events are awesome, though. Just one more time. Yeah! And that ends our chapter on Lucid.js. But I have more horses to fill the gaps between chapters. Really cool horses. Which brings me to chapter four, local storage. When it comes to stashing things on the browser side, there are a few options that are well supported. There's Web SQL, which only works on Chrome and Safari. There's IndexedDB, which works in Firefox and Chrome and sort of works in Internet Explorer and Safari. And local storage, which works absolutely everywhere, but at the expense of being dumb as a rock. <laughs> but actually, the simplicity of local storage is exactly what I'm looking for when I'm building such a simple application as Horse Drawing Tycoon. Let's look at the local storage API. You can write to local storage with set item. Everything you write is saved against a key. In this case, we're saving the string jsconf against the key hi. And we can read from local storage with get item. When you write to local storage, that data sticks around every time the user returns to your web page on the same browser. There are multiple ways to access local storage, using get item and through standard object interfaces. Considering how the key I don't exist does not in fact exist, all three of these calls are going to fail. In this case, because the key doesn't exist, X is null, but Y and Z are undefined. These different ways of accessing local storage data operate differently from one another. So that's a fun surprise. It's recommended that you use get item and set item on account of them working the most consistently across all browsers. Another important thing is that local storage can only deal in string data. So if you're dealing with anything that's not a string, you'll have to serialize and deserialize it, which is pretty easy with JSON stringify and JSON parse. There's one thing to consider when serializing data into strings, self-referential data structures. In JavaScript, self-referential data structures, like this one right here, are unserializable. There are a few options for avoiding this kind of trouble. The first is to make it possible to serialize cycles using something like Douglas Crockford's cycle.js library. Your other option is just not to write code that has a cycle in it. Another thing to potentially concern yourself with is what happens when you run out of space in local storage. Quotas vary from browser to browser and are per domain. You might have 2.5 megabytes, you might have 5 megabytes, and you might have unlimited space. And these are the most common quotas. There are other less common quotas, I'd imagine. If you go over your quota, your browser will throw a quota exceeded error. I bet you're excited to hear how I built my application to cleverly avoid the problem of cyclical data structures and how I cleverly managed to keep my storage needs in check. I completely ignored these things. As it turns out, in an application as small as mine, it's easy not to write any cyclical data structures. And in an application as unpopular as mine, nobody's ever going to generate 2.5 megabytes of horses. So that's the chapter on local storage. So chapter five, horse rank. One feature of my application is that every horse drawing is run through a complicated artificial intelligence algorithm that ranks how horse-like every image is. Except it's actually much dumber than I make it out to be. It's possible to use the get image data function of a context to get the raw data that's being displayed on the screen at any given pixel. The function produces an object. The object has a data element that is simply a very, very long array containing red, green, blue, and alpha information for every pixel. So each pixel takes four spaces in the array, and information is laid out four at a time in red, green, blue, and alpha for each pixel. Alpha being just a fancy graphics word for transparency. So once you get to the end of the row, the array continues with the next row. With that established, it's super easy to build a histogram of colors that the player used and even display that histogram to the user. So the terrible secret of horse rank has been revealed. So while we're talking about cool things that we can do with the entire canvas, let's talk about saving the user's horse, which is actually really easy with the toData URL function. 
This function converts the whole canvas into a URL, but a URL that contains all of the data for the entire image encoded in base64. These strings are very, very long, but they contain all of the data of your entire image. I'm just going to take a quick sip of this water. These things are downright magic. You can just slap them into an image tag, and bam, there's your image. Once the image is serialized like this, it's actually really easy to save. But it's also really easy to tweet. Which brings us to chapter seven, secretly tweeting every single thing the user draws. If you'll navigate to twitter.com slash infinite horse, you'll see a stream of every single horse ever drawn with the application. I take you on a live tour, but if somebody's drawn an obscene horse in the past 20 minutes, it could really shine an unpleasant light on the presentation. The tweet function works about how you'd imagine it. When you finish a horse, the data is sent to a local server, which saves the ping data to a URL and then tweets that URL. I'm going to leave the details of the server largely unexplored. This is a JavaScript com conference, and I built the server machinery in Python. The whole thing fits into 100, uh, about 160 lines and runs on Google App Engine for free. So it's proprietary, it's Python, it's not really what we want to talk about here. Because I hosted the tweet machinery on a different server than the one I'm running Horse Drawing Tycoon on, I have to make a cross-origin request to save that tweet. Which brings us to our chapter on cores. As you know, making a request from one domain to another is forbidden in JavaScript. This is the same origin policy. There are a few ways to get around that. The first, JSONP, loads a script element into the page containing all of the details of its call in the URL. Yes, this is a theoretical horse drawing applica uh, application that might use JSONP. Um, you're always allowed to do this regardless of the origin. In this example, we're visiting the server horse.pix with the data foo and the callback function cb. There's an error in this URL, don't look too closely at it. Then the server responds with a script that contains a callback function that returns any requested data to the application. In this example, we're calling back with the return data bar. This will call a function that you've defined globally, returning control to your application with any data that you've requested. While it seems a little bit convoluted, jQuery will happily abstract most of these details away from you if you just tell it to make a JSONP request to a server. All you really need to do is make sure that your server properly returns a callback. Most other frameworks will do this as well for you. Uh, there are some problems with this strategy, though. For one thing, it's only capable of sending GET requests. If you're a REST fanatic, the thought of using a GET request to set data on a server hurts you to the very core. On top of that, in order to fit our entire image, our URL would have to be over 50,000 characters long. While theoretically there's no limit on URL size, many standards compliant servers and browsers start to choke after about 2,000 characters. And having a crazy long URL will make logging very difficult. So it just seems like a bad idea to use JSONP this way. Which takes us to the other strategy, cores. Cores, or cross-origin resource sharing, is a relatively new feature, but it's now supported in all modern browsers. Cores is really simple. Before making a call to a URL, your browser will check to see if your URL returns a special access control allow origin header containing the domain that you're currently browsing from, or a wildcard which would allow anybody to use the resource from any script. Once the browser has checked that it's OK, it will gladly lift the barriers of the same origin policy for you. So this, again, can be abstracted away with a jQuery option, so long as you spend five minutes or so making sure that your server supports it. And that's it. That's all the technical detail I have for you. Now let's look at some horse drawings. Now, you might imagine that the distribution of horse drawings <laughs> might look like this. 5% actual horse drawings and 95% obscene drawings. But in fact, after looking at a sample of 100 horses, the actual numbers look a lot more like this, with 11% incomprehensible scribbles, 23% recognizable horses, which is actually a surprisingly large number, 1% obscene drawings, they still exist, 30% with some stamps, and 36% with way too many stamps. It's really common for people to discover the stamp tool right away and then draw me something that looks like this. Some of the horses that were drawn were simplistic. Minimalistic, elegant. Other horses were complicated and rich in detail. <laughs> Some people were quite talented at horse drawing. This person seemed to have a lot of trouble drawing a horse. <laughs> and their next drawing supported that theory. 
Some horses were magical. Some horses were fat. Some people had draw, trouble drawing really compelling horses. Some horse artists were very literal, just writing the word horse. Quite, quite a few of them, actually. Horse, yo. I drew a horse. This one looks like an engineer drew a horse. <laughs> one user went in a clever direction and actually drew a horse drawing a tycoon. <laughs> another, another user drew me an ancient cave painting. I have many more interesting horses that I could show you. There are over 2,000 that have been posted since I built the application. But after all this talking, I'm feeling a little hoarse. Ah, another horse bun. Okay, so that's the presentation. I understand that I've thrown a lot of information up on these slides, so if you want to see anything after you've left, you can get the whole slide deck off of this URL. They're also available from my homepage at curtis.lassum.net, but my homepage is served out of California, and it's not behind a CDN, so the whole presentation taking about 40 megabytes could take you several days or years to actually load, which is why I put it up here behind my CDN. <laughs> and thanks for watching, everyone.